I forgot about that. And I forgot my cheat sheet, too. <laughs> too many meetings this morning. So first, uh, thanking the University of Kansas Integrated Health System and our Office of now Academic and Student Affairs uh, that sponsor this program. And to those people who are getting streamed with this, I'm sorry you're missing the lunch. So it is a pleasure to introduce Tony Jones. He's the president of the Kansas City Art Institute. He has an international reputation. Uh, my cheat sheet had said he had six honorary doctorates, and in talking to him, I found out it increased by two to eight now. Um, and then uh, his comment was he hasn't earned any of those. Um, I think that's probably the best kind of doctorate to get. He has an array of international honors. The American Institute of Architects made him an honorary member. Uh, American Lawyers for the Arts gave him a Distinguished Service Award. He holds the title of Austrian Knight's Cross for Service to Education in Europe and is Commander of the British Empire conferred by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Uh, even has a building in downtown Chicago that is named after him. I think the most important thing is uh, his gift of enthusiasm, and you'll see that in the presentation, uh, vision and desire, and I think this is something that we come across all the time, uh, to transform the world creatively, and in his case, through art and design. And I love the title because I've been saying for years to other folks that what we do is herd cats, whether it's on the clinical side or on the basic science side of our institution in whichever school. Uh, we have people who know what they want to do and know what direction they want to go in, and sometimes you have to do some herding. So please welcome Tony Jones. I think that was an introduction that requires no speaker, so I leave now. <laughs> I, I think if, um, if you've actually asked me to come and talk about leadership and to give you any sort of pointers and suggestions, you've asked the wrong person. I have absolutely no qualifications at all to lead anything. Instead, <laughs> I, I've, I've spent my life hinting, suggesting, a nudging that going in this direction might be sort of a good idea. Would you like to come along? And that's my definition of leadership. I am not a top-down leader. I'm not a tyrant. I'm exactly the opposite. And I've been incredibly lucky in the years since I've been administering colleges to have been allowed to do that. The privilege is the word that I use. When it comes to being a CEO, you're privileged to be in that position and that you've been allowed to be in that position. And I got into it absolutely as a complete accident and ended up, toward now the end of my career, as being CEO of uh, three of the top ten schools of art and design in the world and two others tried to get me to go to their places too. So I didn't do this because I intended to do it. It's been entirely a series of accidents. And if I have any understanding of leadership and management seniority, it's by an accretive process, where slowly over the years I have learned, bit by bit by bit, how you actually do this job. And now that I actually do understand how to do it, I can retire. <laughs> I'm here really because um, Marty invited me to do three things. The character of these meetings is to tell the story of uh, an institution or business leader's perspective on a personal basis, a personal perspective. Right? To try to define what that person thinks are the characteristics of leadership and how does that person employ them and what is unique about one's own specific world, what is wonderful about it and also uh, to tell you what is truly horrible there is always a dark side to all of this. The personal side of this is very simple. How many people in this audience today were brought up in a city? How many people were brought up in a town? How many people were brought up in a village? I was brought up in a village of seven houses. 
surrounded by 10 farms. Our school was uh, three miles away. I was taken there every morning on a tractor from a farm. How many people in this room were brought up without electricity? We didn't have electricity until I was 10. So we lived and understood the world of culture entirely through a battery radio. And so my understanding, although I'm in the world of visual arts, my understanding of the arts is based entirely on oral traditions, music, Shakespeare in plays on the radio, opera. Ballet doesn't work really well <laughs> on radio. And I didn't actually see a work of art, a painting in a frame made with paint by a human being until I was 13. So all of that was a great surprise. I lived on a tiny island, a very remote community that is almost as remote today on the far west coast of Britain. I'm an island off a bigger island off the continent of Europe. It was an extremely remote and very difficult place to be. It made for a life that came out of agriculture and a loving parent, parents um, and then step-parents, who looked after me and encouraged the fact that I could draw. I didn't know how well I could draw because I didn't know any artists. But I drew since I was a child. And lived in this isolation of an island. The island was connected to the mainland by a bridge. And I would ask my auntie, what's over there? And my auntie would have this wistful look in her eye. And she would peer at the horizon. And she would put a hand over her heart and she would say, civilization. <laughs> It took a long time to cross that bridge and go to civilization where I found that there were schools and colleges and universities and libraries and, oh my goodness, an art gallery where I actually saw for the first time a work of art. And when I realized that it had been created not by a god but by a human being, I decided I wanted to join that company. And so I was lucky enough to be able to go to the University of London on scholarship, to go to Goldsmiths College to train to be a painter and a sculptor and an art historian. And all of those things have driven the life that I have led. One of the things that has been so extraordinary about this is that even though coming from a tiny and remote and difficult place with almost no visual arts background at all, I've been able to travel the world. I spent a lot of time in China, a lot of time in Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, all over the world, talking to artists, designers, craftspersons, architects, about how what we do on a daily basis improves the quality of life of large numbers of people. This is important because schools of art and design, by definition, are very, very small. But the impact they have on society is absolutely extraordinary. So I've been trying to measure that impact in all of the places that I've worked. How does it work? What does it do? What is the social need? How do we address that? Everything in this room and everything about you except your DNA was designed by another human being. That is the design process. The design process is small groups of people designing working on a product or a process that will improve the quality of life of a very large number of people. Uh, that's the process that, that we work in. So I became very interested in, in that and it afforded me the opportunity to think more broadly. So even though I had that tiny, tiny island as my base, the opposite side of that was to travel throughout the world and to talk to people who are designing and leading schools of art and design that have an extraordinary impact. I was lucky enough to be able to get a scholarship to come to study and do postgraduate work in the United States. This is the story of my first six hours in the United States. I come on a boat. It's a great big ship called the US United States. Very beautiful liner. I'm in steerage, down there in the bottom, next to the propeller shaft. <laughs> Sleep is not really much of an option. So I wander the decks at night, and I look, etc. And then we're all told, 
all Fulbright scholars must get up early in the morning, five o'clock, go up onto the decks because we were approaching the city of New York. It's the 3rd of August, 1966. It's my birthday. The sun is behind us, of course, rising from the east. The ship is going down the river underneath the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Extraordinary experience. Sunlight is touching the top of the Empire State Building. World Trade Center wasn't built at that time, 1966. Light touches the top, comes down slowly as we approach New York, touches the torch at the top of the Statue of Liberty. We're all in tears. It's the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. Absolutely extraordinary. We're coming to America to study at great universities. We're going to have a wonderful time. It's very exciting. We come down the gangplank, and there's a young lady standing there with a big sign. It says, Fulbright scholars, come over here. So we go over here. It's about 9 o'clock in the morning now. So we all mill around, and we're given our papers. One of the things that we're given is a piece of paper with the name of our hotel. We are to go to a hotel, a cab, a minibus. Cab is going to take us to our hotel. A hotel in New York. Oh, I'm so excited. It's the Grand Central YMCA. <laughs> you remember that song? That song is a documentary. The Grand Central YMCA. It takes me all of 10 seconds to unpack because I don't have anything. A little box, you know, some clothes, that's it. So by this time, uh, it's 11 o'clock. And I decide to have a wander around. So I go out and I walk around. And um, it's very exciting because it's New York, it's 1966, a lot of noise, traffic, you know, all the sort of, all the things that I'd seen in movies had come to life in front of me in New York. So I, I was really very, very excited about all of this. Um, and then realized I was hungry. So I'd go and get something to eat. But I didn't realize that in America, people ate at noon. In Europe, and certainly in Britain, we eat at one. So, uh, I decided to go and get something to eat. Well, on the corner of the street is a large sign that says Automat. And I knew what an Automat was because I'd seen it in American movies. You went in and there was this wall made of aluminium with these little uh, opening containers and, and you bought food that was in there. It was on the splash. I said, great, I'll go and do this. You see. Horn and hard heart Automat, it said. So I go in there, and, and I stand in the room. Well, I didn't realize, of course, that it was, it was now rush hour for lunch. So there were hundreds and hundreds of people in there. I said, I'm, I'm desperately trying to, uh, to work out what I want. So in the end, I go for the, you know, the traditional, I'll have a hamburger and some chips, french fries. And then a, a, a horrible moment of truth comes. I don't know how to use the money. Because I'd been given a packet of American money but I didn't know what it was. I'd been born and brought up on pounds, shillings, and pence. And now we have this decimalized currency, so you know, I couldn't work out what it was. I remember Winston Churchill saying, what does that damn dot mean? <laughs> so I didn't know what a dollar twenty-nine was. I thought it was 129. Complete confusion. I'm trying to do this, and the gentleman who's standing behind me says, what, what are you trying to do? I said, I'm trying to buy these, but I literally, I said, this sounds terrible. I've just got off the boat. <laughs> I've just got off the boat. I, d I don't know what to do. You know, see? He says, and he says, what do you want? And I said, well, I want that and that. You see, and I've got my little tray. And he, sh he reaches over, and he puts the money in there. See? And, we, and I pull this out. <clears throat> and I, I pull out the food, and I put it on my little tray. See? And I turn around to say thank you. And it's Andy Warhol. And uh, I, you know, I kind of stopped dead, and I said, um, you're Andy Warhol. He said, how do you know that? I said, you just had a major exhibition in London of contemporary American painting. I know exactly who you are. He said, how do you know? I said, well, I'm an art student, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to study here. I'm doing my postgraduate work. I'm a painter and a sculptor. He said, what did I have in the show? I said, well, you had this, and I described all this. So we're standing here, and of course, all the rest of the people are going, would you like to move on, move on? You know, <laughs> like typical New York stuff. So he says, 
come over here. So there's a, a window seat, and we managed to sit at the window seat. And I have a two-hour conversation, during which I called him Mr. Warhol the entire time, uh, which seemed to charm him. Uh, and we talked about art, and we talked about why I was, was in America, and the cultural differences, and the shock, and the wanting to know how American artists were trained, and what they did, and how they made their work, and what was the sociological and anthropological issues surrounding the work. And we have this long conversation with one of the most important working artists in America, incredibly generous and very friendly. Uh, and he said, uh, well, uh, he said, so what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I'm staying in the Grand Central YMCA. He said, oh, yes. He said, my studio is directly opposite that. He said, you should go over there. He said, uh, I have to leave. He said, I have to go somewhere. He said, but go down there. And um, he said, right opposite, there's a bell on the wall. He said, it says, the factory. Push the bell. And, uh, and uh, the uh, elevator will come down. The lift will come down, take you up there. So I go up. I go down, push the button. Uh, I open the door, and this is some stunningly beautiful girl wearing a dress uh, that is made out of bako foil. It's made out of, of crushed aluminium cooking foil, right? Which has been glued together and stapled together. And she's wearing this. Like this guy. And she says, Who are you? I said, Well, I said, uh, well, I'm Tony Jones, and I'm an art student from London, and um, I just had lunch with Mr. Warhol. And she said, Mr. Warhol? And where did you have this lunch with this Mr. Warhol? I said, at the Automat. Oh, yeah, she said, he goes there all the time. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> and she gives me a tour. And, and in there, there are these young men and women printing Brillo boxes, printing soup cans, making all this artwork that now sells for millions and millions and millions of dollars in the middle of this scruffy, nasty loft in the middle of New York, next to the Grand Central YMCA, and, um, and I leave and go back to my hotel room. That's my first six hours in America. So everything that I love about America, generosity of spirit, yeah, commitment to the arts, you know, people who are prepared to talk about what they're doing, a genuine sense of kindness, yeah, all of that informed me from the very day that I got off the boat. Then I went on to do my postgraduate work deciding that I wanted to be somewhere culturally different from my tiny island, completely different from London, in every sense, culturally, anthropologically, in terms of history, and in terms of climate. I went to New Orleans, <laughs> where I lived at 1218 Bourbon Street in the middle of the French Quarter for three years in a non-air-conditioned apartment while studying at Tulane. That is another story. But that's how I began that track of understanding a worldview, or beginning to understand a worldview. I didn't have any such grand thoughts when I was a student. I didn't know what a worldview actually meant. But I tried to get that sense of how artists and designers work, how they worked in the UK. I had been to Europe, and I was in the US. I was trying to get that sense of what artists do and how you can make that work. And I began to understand the nature of working with artists, who are a very, very different group of people. Artists, designers, architects, people who work in crafts, media, and technology do not think in the way that people who are in medical schools, or engineering schools, or law schools, or nursing schools, they just don't think that way. They're a completely different way of thinking. Orthogonal thinkers, as someone said. People who don't fit into statistics. They just have a different way of thinking. So therefore, how do you create an educational system for people who pride themselves on the fact that they don't fit? That they don't think the same way as other people. They don't even see the same way. High proportion of them have some form of dyslexia. It's a known fact. So these people are very, very interesting people. But how you heard these art cats is really a problem because of that nature of the way that they think. So when you think about trying to be a leader, you try to think about the characteristics that you have. You try to think about these people and how you're going to be able to work with them and how you're going to be able to move them. You think about CEO positions 
And you think when you eventually make the mistake of going on a committee, don't ever go on a committee. Because <laughs> the next thing you know, you're the chair, and the next thing, you're the dean, and then you're the president, right? It's a death march to leadership. Huh? Bob is shaking his head, knowing exactly what, what I mean. So you try to work out what leadership means, and you try to think about who did you know? Who did I know on a farm, on a tiny island, off the west coast of Britain in 1966, that I would actually recognize as having qualities of leadership? Very difficult. When I got to the University of London, who did I naturally see as being a leader? So if I asked you that question, you'd say, well, there are people in your family, there are people in your profession that you know as leaders, there are people that you've read about, historical people, there are people that you see every day on the news and you think they're leaders too, diminishing number, I have to say. So how do we find out the characteristics of leadership? So you have parents, teachers, mentors, families, people from history, people you see every day, and you try to work out what is the common agreement on the characteristics of those leaders. It's a very little, interesting little experiment that I ran one day. I asked a group of people, about 40 of them, to give me their definitions and the qualities that they thought they see in leaders and managers. Now, if I was to say that to you, you're probably going to say, well, they're able to do this and this and this. You come up with three or four. We came up with 51. At the end of a two-hour discussion, we came up with all the things that we thought that were good about leaders. What do leaders have? What do they do? And the list is actually very interesting. Inspirational, charismatic, trustworthy, lead by example, common sense, business skills, builds consensus, passionate about what they do, ethical, moral, has shiny shoes, <laughs> is heroic, intelligent, a practitioner actually understands what they're doing. A mentor, a planner, an enabler, a spokesperson is brave, loves art and artists or any of the professions they're involved with, articulates complex concepts lucidly, doesn't talk down to people, looks good on TV, <laughs> gives great interviews, is intuitive, is a magician, a visionary, has clarity of thought and expression, doesn't micromanage, and doesn't duplicate effort. Very, very important. You have people working, let them get on with it. As we say in Scotland, why die, buy a dog and bark yourself? <laughs> is transparent, is values-led, energetic, is clean, is approachable, is positive alpha, an intellectual, has character, personality, a natural, whatever that means, an ambassador, a team builder, is truthful, has nice teeth, <laughs> listens, is gracious, is kind, compliments staff, remembers their names and what they do, has a generosity of spirit, is decisive, unapproachable. 51 definitions. But they're not the definitions that you think they are. They are the definitions of 40 second-year MBA students at the National University of Singapore. And all of these definitions apply to their belief in what American business leaders have, not their own leaders. So I ask them, if you've never been to America, and you're thinking about what you see about business leaders, what you read about them, you know, whoever it, it is, you know, what do you think about them? That list is their perception of what they think American business leaders are and what they do and how they should be. Within that group of 40, second year MBA, some of them have been out there in the world of work. I asked only that group to talk about the observable bad qualities in managers and leaders. And we came up with, remember, 51 on this list, 48. <laughs> this is what they had experienced 
in their placements during the summer for their internship programs, they had observed and had experienced and been treated by people who were mean-spirited, punishing, not collegial, who behaved in inappropriately, who were punishing, arrogant, insulting, hasty, had dandruff, <laughs> gossiped, were self-serving, and claimed credit undeservedly, were unimaginative, yelled at people, micromanaged, were greedy, tyrannical, ego-driven, abrasive, stole, were cowards, creepy, unfair, didn't learn anything, were spiteful, exhausting to work for, unpredictable, sexist, ageist, racist, vindictive, cold-hearted, inconsiderate, unkind, manipulative, lazy, boozed, smelled, were unsupportive, sneered, were alpha-dominant, devious, liars, slimy, gloomy, contrary by nature, sly, grumpy, callous, cynical, hypocritical, and just plain nasty. <laughs> when you put those two lists together, you have a pretty good set of guideposts about what you think leadership is supposed to be. And through your life, as you try to work as a chief executive, you try to work out what you're doing on those two lists so that you can share and respect and value the people that you work with. So that you can communally decide through consensus how you're actually going to do what you're supposed to do. I think that belongs in the world of medicine, belongs in the world of engineering, belongs in aerospace, belongs, belongs absolutely everywhere. You have to come up with those kinds of plans because they essentially are a prescription for how you're going to manage. There are two ways of looking at this. One is more historical and one is about contemporary practice. The historical one is I read a wonderful book some years ago called In the Heart of the Sea uh, by Nathaniel Philbrick and it was about whaling and about the whalers. It was made into a terrible film but it's about whalers, and there's a wonderful thing in which Philbrick describes the character of the captains of the great whaling ships that went out from New Bedford and, and uh, from the American northeast coast and went out whaling. And he described these, these captains in this way. They spoke only to command. They commanded only to be obeyed. Ah. Uh, that is not exactly the model that we see in American universities today. Instead, we are not looking at that tyrannical way of top-down instruction and scolding, etc. We have come to the idea of consensus building, and that's what leadership is today about. All voices will be heard. Everyone participates in the management process, and everyone respects the final decision of the person who holds executive authority. This is called shared governance. And this is the practice which we try to put in place every day in places like myself. You govern by consent and you lead because you've been allowed to lead. And your success is your team's success. Everybody shares the good and sometimes the not so good. But you do work together. When you're allowed to be in that position, it is very much a privilege and it is very much an honor. It isn't easy and you have to decide if you're going to do it. I had the tipping point in which, in my life, I made that decision. I am trained uh, as a painter and a sculptor. I'm good with my hands. I'm good with machinery. I know how to use wood, metal, steel, plastics. I know how to do all of those things. I was trained that way. I was a pretty good and determined artist, but the day came when I realized that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't going to be a great artist. I could not meet the standard that I'd set for myself. So I stopped making art and instead decided that my real role should be a servant to those who could make good art, great art, and be great artists, designers, craftspersons, architects, engineers, designers, all of those things. And I became a servant to those people by becoming the president of schools of art and design. I've ended up, instead of working in my studio, being an enabler. 
And I'm able to do that because I do have some respect from the people who I work with because I come out of the actual studio background. Hmm? Maybe it's like being a surgeon or a great nurse or a great engineer. You actually come from understanding what the tools are, what the process is, what the equipment is, what the destination is supposed to be. You try to work in that way to provide better environments, in fine art or design, media, tech. It's a rapidly changing world. I became very interested in the idea of small scale. So the impact of colleges of art and design, as I said, is out of all proportion to the minuteness of their scale. It's quite small. Kansas City Art Institute, our total student number is 630. Royal College of Art London, the number one school of art and design in the world, by common consent, always ranked that way. When I was the director there, we did a little survey. You could not live in Britain without being touched by a product of the Royal College of Art every day of your life. Absolutely extraordinary. Cars, world's best vehicle design program. Clothes, medical devices, industrial products, boats, movies, stamps, coinage, banknotes, cutlery, jewelry, buildings, textiles, furniture, and vacuum cleaners because James Dyson was a student at the Royal College of Art. Now produces those, you know, this, the air dip, all of that kind of technology. The key difference from medical schools and business schools and engineering schools and nursing schools and all the rest is that art schools work in an utterly different way. The key to it is this. And this is a subtle thing, but it's very important. Uncertainty of outcome is the objective. Uncertainty of outcome is the objective. Unfettered creativity is the norm. The ability to measure success is irrelevant. Failure is to be encouraged. There is no right answer or solution, and there can be no proof that there is such a solution. All the practitioners are different. They're artists, architects, designers. All of those people work in a completely different way. Because in that world of creative invention and constantly changing ways of making things, there is no answer. There is no way of delivering, as you would say in the sciences, a proof. Instead, it is the movement of those ideas through various permeable membranes, disciplines, and materials that actually is the process. And it may lead to something wonderful. The most difficult thing of all to say to parents when you talk about their sons and daughters being successful is this. Their success in the world of work will be a byproduct of their attending an art school, not a direct result. That is not the way that it works in the world of science and engineering. And that is, the reason for that is that any number of surveys of people who are successful in everything from rock and roll bands to movie directors to theater costume directors to people who are working in every area you can possibly think of. When you talk to those people, the common bottom line is that they all were in art school. They all say, oh, I wouldn't be this successful if I hadn't gone to art school. The art school provided me a kind of trampoline, a kind of a, a place where I could bounce ideas around all the time and eventually launch them off into a universe that I never thought that I would be able to access. I had no idea that that was out there, and I had no idea that I was going to do this. Is it because I did this in art school? No. It's because the art school gave me that platform to allow me to launch off in this different way. It is not a direct result. But these people are incredibly successful because what art schools allow you to do is take ideas, multiple universes of knowledge out there, take ideas from all sorts of different places and glue them together in completely unpredictable, unexpected, and previously never done ways. I've stopped calling an art college an art college. I call it an art collage. <laughs> Because today, in the world of the digital world, where the ability to be able to glue 
ideas that are sounds, animations, pieces of music, drawings, images from the past, being able to draw those together and stick them together in ways that we've never seen before. That is the nature of the artistic process. More and more, because of the kind of student that we have coming to colleges of art and design, these are the students who are part of the digital revolution. Except that only we, those of us of our age, think of it as a revolution. They don't. They just see it as evolution. They just see an upgrade every day. What's to be expected? It's nothing unusual. It's nothing shocking. And they want more of it. We see the surprise factor in all of that because we lived in that change. We saw that tipping point. We saw the way technology, the digital world, has affected us. Those students don't see that. They just use it all the time. That's part of their character. But I can also tell you this. There's a new part of that character that is becoming very, very well defined. I'm hearing this from friends in China. I'm hearing it from friends in Australia. I'm hearing everybody is talking about this. The metronome has swung the other way. So if you talk to many, many of these students who come to schools of art and design, they talk about a sense of loss. Something's missing. If you get them to articulate it in depth, if you talk to them closely about that, they'll say, you know, um, I love my cell phone and my iPad and my iMac. I'm never going to give up any of those things, but, but somehow it's not enough. You know, it's not enough. I, I was born with these. I, I have these. And, and I like them to do something. Yeah? I, I don't think that my world should be ruled by creativity at my fingertips or manipulating a mouse. I, I, want, I want a lump of clay. I want a tool. I want a drill. I want a hammer, a chisel. I, I want a loom. I want fabric. I want materials. Yeah? I want something where I understand where things have come from. I did a presentation in uh, uh, China, in Shanghai, last year. There were a thousand art students in the auditorium, and I talked about the nature of our academic program. And these students were there, sort of, you know, yes, this is very exciting, very interesting, one thing. But the tipping point moment in that presentation was when I said, so we have a big program in Kansas City, very famous program in fiber and textiles, and we, we work in this. And you know, if you... If you work in those materials, you need to know where they come from. You need to have a respect for the origin of the materials. Because when you do, you'll actually know better how to use them. And I put a slide on the screen, and I said, so if you come to Kansas City and you work in our textiles and fiber program, you are required to learn to shear a sheep. <laughs> I don't know what the Chinese for you've got to be kidding, <laughs> is. But there was that oh my god moment. And the rest of the time that I was in Shanghai and Ningbo, those students kept on saying, it's, it's not true, is it? Really? <laughs> you know? And you know, sheep, like, you know, what, like what is a sheep? I mean, it's an ugly thing. You know? and, and it smells. And yes, but you get a clippers and you hold on to it. And actually, it's quite nice. It won't bite you, I promise. And it's nice and warm. It's made of wool, after all. It's nice and warm. <laughs> uh, and, and you can shave it. And, and then you card the wool and you spin it and you actually make something. So from start to finish, you understand the process. And I think what I was hearing from those Chinese students was the same thing I'm hearing from American students. We don't want to just work with our fingertips. The technology is there and we'll use it. So perhaps we're going to work entirely in computer-driven animation. Perhaps we're going to work entirely in some digital media world. But we also want to know how to make things. So that's what you've got. Up on the top of Rock Hill here in Kansas City, you've got a set of manufacturing studios where we know how to make things in wood, metal, plastic. We teach that craft of manufacture while at the same time working in that digital world. And we set that within a historical context. On one side, we've got the Nelson Atkins Museum, one of the world's great museums, an encyclopedic museum of art back from the days of Mesopotamia and, and Egypt to contemporary expression. And on the other side of the street, 
to the left of my campus on Warwick Boulevard, you have the Kemper Museum dedicated entirely to contemporary practice. And you've got us in the middle with our studios. Hmm? Think of it this way, two showrooms and a factory. <laughs> By joining those together, that education allows a student who is interested only in the digital world, or a student who's working in clay and fiber and steel and metal, you afford them that opportunity to understand how the creative spirit can move through these multiple ways of working. 80% of all students entering schools of art and design with the idea that they're going to be something, a painter, an illustrator, a weaver, 80% of those students by the end of the second year are working in something different. Because the purpose of being in the School of Art and Design is to reveal to them that there are opportunities beyond those finger press, beyond moving that mouse, and far beyond the limited resources in art and design that now exist in diminishing resources in American high schools. It's a real problem. We try to show them how that creativity can apply. There was a survey undertaken a few years ago by the Americans for the Arts. They surveyed the CEOs of all the Fortune 500 companies. And one of the questions that they asked those CEOs is, what is it that you think is failing you in American higher education? Every single one of them said, creativity. Colleges and universities are not teaching creativity. They're not teaching entrepreneurship. If we don't have that, then we can't secure the American markets we have, expand those markets beyond American shores, and succeed internationally, or grow entirely new markets that we don't even know about yet. We're just not seeing it. It is not coming out of American colleges and universities. So, oh my goodness, we're having to go to the art schools, where you've got these really smart people who know how to stick these ideas together in different ways. But that social role is already changing, and the students that come to us, well, they're already looking at all of that. They're very different from the kind of people that you would know in schools of nursing, schools of, uh, uh, of medicine, etc. So you have to try to work out how you actually can direct them or even herd them. So I come from a tiny island, so I've been brought up all my life with boats. So my natural tool, all managers develop tools. Right? You have a Gantt chart, or you have a this or a that or something else. Very simple. My leadership compass is a compass. <laughs> North is to the executive board who gave you the job and who watches what you do. So this can be the trustees of your institution, your dean, your president, your, whoever runs your company. Right? Very simple. You have to look northward to ensure that they know what you're up to and that they allow you to do it. East is the delivery system. This is the management and operations team that you've put together and which support the mission of your institution, no matter what it is. You can't function without them. Right? So you have to look at the symbiosis between the group on the east and the group on the west. The Western group are specific to your mission. Now, it could be a medical school, nursing school, engineering school, whatever. You have a defined mission that you've worked out by consensus. This is what you're supposed to do. And you're projecting forward. And the litmus test for that is reasonableness of projection. Has your team come to a consensus that is reasonable, credible, fundable? It's not going to drive you off the edge of a cliff. Right? Allow you to actually work out where it is you want to go. So you have to balance the ambitions of that mission, that's the West, with the team on the East saying, this is how we're actually going to do this. And the Southern team is a wide array of providers. That's the group of people, the roots, if you like, the group of people who are providing you the tools, the materials, the processes, and the money through fundraising to do what you want to do. If you can deploy all of your resources by remembering that compass, then you have a fairly effective management tool that can change every day, but it's an ability for you to be able to measure the progress of your plan. If you can do that, you have an opportunity to be able to have a plan that everybody understands because it's very, very simple. And you should be able to lay it out very, very simply. There is now a tool, it's very entertaining, to have a building named after me in 
downtown Chicago, but the tool I like most of all is known as Tony's ABC. And this is now used particularly by accreditation and reaccreditation teams like the Higher Learning Council, etc. It's very simple. So you need to remember this. Tony's ABC. A, B, C. A is for accuracy. B is for brevity. C is for candor. A, get it right. Make sure your sums add up. This is dead simple stuff, isn't it? A is for accuracy. Make sure that you do actually know what you're doing and what you're saying. B is for brevity. Don't go on and on and on. You know, I was brought up in a very loquacious, very breathy, very gassy environment of people <laughs> who whinged on endlessly when they could have said it in 10 words. <laughs> Kanda, if you don't know, tell them you don't know. Tell your team you don't know. Be honest about this. Say, you know, I don't know how we're going to do this. Any ideas? If I'm the smartest person in the room, we're in trouble. <laughs> what ideas do we have that actually make credible the plan that we're putting forward? If you do that with teams of people, it's just terrific. And being flexible, having fluidity, that being honest, being accurate, keeping it short, and the ability to be able to trust your team to do things. Because very, very few people do things alone anymore. How many of you watch movies? Okay. The average list of names in the credits at the end of movies is now 250. Sometimes more. Because that's what it takes. I spent a day at Pixar in California. It was absolutely great. They have an aircraft hangar. And it's filled with all these creative types, all these art cats, all busy working away doing things. And the, you know, they're making models of Shrek and dinosaurs and Toy Story and all the rest of the kind. It's a wonderful and absolutely terrific place to work. And I have lunch with John Lasseter. And I do this because we have 14 students from Chicago, where I was uh, president of the Art Institute. We have 14 students there. And we've got about eight students from Kansas City Art Institute, all working at Pixar, working on the next Toy Story, the next, you know, whatever it's going to be. And I asked John, um, when you get people apply to work here, and everybody would want to work at Pixar, I mean, it's a really funny place, because it's just absolutely great. Um, what characteristics are you looking for? And he said, oh, it's very simple, uh, drawing and um, sociability. And I said, um, he said, drawing is still, he said, you teach drawing, so we like this very much. Chicago teaches drawing, we like it very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Drawing is still the fastest way of being able to communicate an idea from one person to another. It's dead simple. The mouse, let's call this mouse Mickey. <laughs> the mouse comes into the room, something happens with the mouse, the mouse leaves the room. Yeah. That's the story. Well, what is it? Well, if you, if you are able to draw, you can draw very quickly what your idea is. See, Mickey comes in, this is what, oh, ha, ha, what this is, okay, oh, ooh, ooh, yeah, and he goes out. So a whole team of people around you have now seen that. Drawing is the fastest way of being able to communicate. So we love people who can draw. I said, great. And he said, sociability is when you don't mind somebody reaching over your shoulder and drawing on your drawing. Ooh. No, 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 no. Yes, 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 yes. The reason that there are 250 names at the end of every movie is that everybody reached over everybody's shoulder and drew on the drawing. Because you can't do anything alone anymore. It's a world of collaboration. In the visual arts, sculpture gets bigger and bigger. It takes 50 people to put it together. Painting is very much the same. You have to have all these mechanisms and systems. Anything to do with media and technology, dozens and dozens of people with different kinds of ability all have to be able to put this together so that you can make something come to life at the end. So even though you are a leader, you are the chief collaborator. And you lead a team, and you have to have the sense to understand that sometimes your leadership of the team is the wrong leadership. And you need to move to the next seat and let somebody else take over. Even if it's only for one project for one day, you have to be able to understand that <coughs> excuse me, collaborative process, which is now driving everything that we do in the visual arts, the entertainment arts, the media arts. All of that is about collaboration. 
So leadership becomes mutable, moves around, becomes flexible. So you have to be agile, you have to be flexible, there is no choice. You have to be able to manage team changes, you have to be adroit, and you have to be far-sighted. And by far, I mean three years, five at the most. The world is changing so fast, that the way in which we are addressing the nature of teaching requires the ability to change very, very rapidly. The students that we have today are not the students that we had five years ago. They're not the students we had 10 years ago. 15 years ago may as well be from a different planet. The immersive, digital-driven, post-digital revolution student of today is working and thinking and has access to universes of knowledge that no student has ever had before. So the challenge of leadership for people who are designing programs is how you make those relevant, how you make them elastic, how you make them work for those ever-changing students. Two years from now, we'll have a very different kind of student entering KCAI. We know that these students just think and see and work and assemble ideas in ways that we've never seen before. So you have to work out how to be able to do that. And that is very much part of being a leader. Leaders come from all sorts of different places. Some of them come from tiny little islands off the west coast of Britain. One of my favorite leaders is a chap named Bill Rodriguez. Everybody, anybody ever heard this name? William Rodriguez was uh, uh, at work in the World Trade Center on the day of the attack. And uh, Bill Rodriguez, by many people who were in the building who survived the attack, said he is the person who actually exhibited leadership on that day and in that place that saved hundreds and hundreds of people's lives. He was a janitor. He knew where the exits were. He knew where the staircases were. He knew the building so well that his leadership, which he doesn't even define as leadership, was that he led an ability to be able to take high-ranking executives, people who are used to controlling millions and billions of dollars, etc., take those people, lead them by the hand, and get them to the door to get them out. And many, many people, hundreds of people, who were saved afterwards said, if it hadn't been for Bill Rodriguez, we wouldn't have made it. He was the leader. We empowered him. He led us. He was in charge. We gave him that. We respected his knowledge on that day. Leaders come from very strange and very different places. So I want to finish up by just saying two things. Um, I didn't say this. I have a friend who's a CEO of a major corporation in the US, and she said it. The way of working in leadership is about being able to develop a concept so that people will trust you you trust their judgment. It's a partnership in taking any idea forward. She said, I hire people for their technical ability to get things done. I fire them for their lack of values and people skills. That's what leaders do. It's quite extraordinary. There was a book published in 2005. Many people read it, say it's a great book, very exciting, called Good to Great. And it was an analysis of 11 companies that had a particular and unique characteristic. And this is what was said about them. They had the essence of lasting success. 11 companies. Five of them have crashed, gone broke, got taken over, or were sold off. Nearly always because of frozen leadership. Because the leaders didn't trust the teams of people they were working with, didn't seek consensus, didn't ask for help, and just got frozen and ended up with their companies crashing. So flexibility in leadership, partnership with people, ability to ask people, not be scared to ask them, and have people be part of your creating a plan. And the final characteristic that I think everybody needs to have is humility. Be, be humble about who you are. Don't get above yourself. My lesson in humility uh, is one that I carry around with me every day. It's an essay. I have it here. It's an essay written by my son when he was a very small boy. 
uh, this big. He was required in school to write an essay about his father, moi. <laughs> this is the entire essay. My father goes to places where people have to listen to him, and then comes home where we don't. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> Surely. Um, the, the School Art Institute in Chicago, I love how it faces the lake and your building is such traditional, but the school itself is so contemporary in how you build the bridge between the two of those. So that's amazing. I can see why they named it after you. Um, the second one is I want to know when it was your birthday and you were coming into New York and you were witnessing that. If you've ever painted, drawn, or if you've captured that moment in your own personal art. Um, uh, thank you about Chicago. Yeah, I mean, Chicago has been an extraordinary success story. Um, it's, it's quite wonderful. Um, that moment in New York, I see it every day. Uh, actually, every sunrise, I think about that moment of, of what happened, being on that trip and, you know, uh, and arriving. Um, I did put it into work that I made at that time. Uh, because the, my work, the, the artwork that I was making in the UK changed the moment I got to the US, which was one of the purposes. I wanted America to challenge me, um, you know, remove the assumptions that I had about the way I was making work. So that uh, transformative moment of moving from one culture and one history of my life to a new one literally comes uh, from stepping off the gangplank. So it's like I said to Mr. Warhol, you know, I just got off the boat. I, when I got off the boat, it was that transformative moment. And, and I thought about that a lot. Um, and I studied in New Orleans, a completely different climate. Um, I, I'm a sculptor. So when you make pieces of sculpture in a Celtic climate, you make it to um, tolerate rain you know, and gloom. You know. I got to New Orleans, and I could rely on 250 days of sunshine every day. A very different way of thinking about work. What what does the work look like? I worked on very large scales. So what did the work look like when it was outside? Works amazing, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it was um, it was quite shocking in in every way. I mean, the, the culture of New Orleans, for example, you know, more of a melange, even more than um, than, than London was in 1966. But I mean, I was there in swinging London. It was very interesting, if you could afford it. Uh, <laughs> So, so going to New Orleans, going from New York to New Orleans was, it was really a two-step. The first step being that, that shock of being on that boat and getting off that boat um, in, in New York on that day. You know, was it, there are moments in one's life. You know, somebody once said, um, there are two important days in your life, the day you were born, and the second is the day you find out why. <laughs> so it was a double why moment when I got off the, the, the boat in New York. I began to understand what I was doing uh, in, in terms of my work. And New Orleans made me change that work, made me change that way of thinking. OK, one o'clock. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. OK.